Oklahoma's linebacker depth and versatility is going to be key for the Sooners in 2024. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. I'm John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John nine Williams. The show is at locked on Sooners. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. So hit that notification bell, hit that like button and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We've been going position by position over the last few weeks through the Oklahoma Sooners depth chart and talking about everything that's that's the big question with each of these units. Last week, we talked about how the defensive line is going to be a big reason why Oklahoma has so much success in 2024. We're going to talk linebackers today, and we know that Danny Stutzman is going to be one of your starters. We just know that he's going to be a guy that gets 600, 700 snaps for your defense. Uh, he is locked in. I mean, this was a guy that could have gone to the NFL draft, probably been a top 100 pick, going to play some, for somebody on Sundays in his future, comes back to Oklahoma. We get one more year of Danny Stutzman, of his tenacity, of his aggression, of his playmaking ability. But who's going to be playing alongside him in those two, three linebacker sets? If we consider a cheetah linebacker, a linebacker, who's going to be playing alongside Danny Stutzman? Now that is a question I think that is yet to be answered. We, we feel like Desan McCullough probably has a bit of a leg up still in the Cheetah linebacker discussion. He's got some work at Will linebacker as well, playing a little bit more on ball or off ball linebacker as opposed to in the along the line of scrimmage or out in coverage, playing more inside where his length and his athleticism might be able to uh, make, a, make a bigger difference. But we know that Kip Lewis, Jaron Kanick, Kobe McKenzie, those three guys are each going to factor in. They played a lot last year. I expect them to play a lot this year as well. But now you're seeing guys that were younger, still kind of coming along. The freshmen, Lewis Carter, Sam Omasigo, Phil Picciotti, those guys made some noise in spring ball. They, they got a lot of eyeballs on them for their productivity, for that athleticism, for their speed. And so it wouldn't surprise me to see Oklahoma be able to go three deep at each linebacker spot this year. You look at middle linebacker and, you know, Danny Stutzman traditionally had played weak side linebacker for Oklahoma. Wouldn't surprise me to see them move him more to that Mike role, especially if a guy like Kip Lewis is going to be potentially your weak side linebacker. But what's cool about Oklahoma's linebacker depth is it's a dynamic group and it's versatile. You know, if you need more speed out there, say you're playing a team that's going to be running more East West kind of stuff maybe like a Mississippi state. Now you're not playing Mississippi state this year, but you're going to play teams that aren't going to want to attack Oklahoma uh, inside. They're not going to want to go down the middle on Oklahoma because of what the defensive line depth chart looks like. And so maybe you need a little bit more speed. So you have a Kip Lewis that can provide that speed, that playmaking ability. He can get outside. He can chase stuff down on the perimeter and he's very, very good at darting through the line of scrimmage and making things happen in the backfield. We saw it last year as well. You've got Kobe McKenzie. Say you're playing a team that wants to be a downhill running team. They want to force the issue, make Oklahoma you know, win along the line of scrimmage. They're going to test you physically with strength. I think of a team kind of like Alabama, maybe, you know, in years past, they're trying to get downhill on you. Will they run stuff wide? Absolutely. Will they use their speed and athleticism? Absolutely. But they want to get downhill on you. Now we'll see what an Alabama team looks like with Kalen DeBoer at the helm. It may not be as downhill as we're used to in the past. Uh, but, I mean, there are going to be teams on Oklahoma's schedule that want to go attack downhill. Well, maybe that's when a guy like Kobe McKenzie and his size and his physicality, and that comes and that benefits you in your linebacker core. What's great about what Oklahoma's got at linebacker is it is so deep and it is so versatile. You've got elite athletes like Lewis Carter, Sam Omasigo, and Jaron Kanick out there. Kip Lewis showed a lot of athleticism, but a lot of instincts, really. And this is a group that's grown together over the last couple of years. You know, this is Jaron Canick's third year in the program now. 
Uh, this is Kip Lewis's third year. Kobe McKenzie's third year in the program. We got year two for Samuel Masigo and Lewis Carter and Phil Picciotti. Danny Stutzman, this is fourth year with Brent Venables. Or third year with Brent Venables, I should say. Sorry. But it's his fourth year playing a significant role for the Oklahoma Sooners. And so all these guys are growing together. They're growing in their understanding of what Brent Venables wants on defense. And you have a leader like Danny Stutzman leading the way, leading the charge. And now with Zach Alley in tow, I mean, all of this is coming together for Oklahoma's linebacker group to be the best it's been in a really, really long time. And they've had some really good linebackers over the years. Kenneth Murray, Brian Omas, uh, Asamoah. They've been good at times, but they've never, they haven't been elite for a really long time, it feels like. But this group, with the talent that it's got, even though we've got some, you know, some position battles happening, maybe at Cheetah with Dasan McCullough and Kendall Dolby and Sam Omasigo, uh, maybe at one of the other linebacker spots next to Danny Stutzman, it's going to be a really, really good group. And because of that, that experience now and that versatility, I mean, it's going to ha have a chance to be one of the best linebacker groups in the nation, I think. And as the defensive line goes, it's only going to help the linebacker group be better than what it was a year ago, which it was pretty good last year. But because you added guys like Dominic Williams and David Stone and Jaden Jackson, and you bulked up Grayson Halton, and you've got Dejon Terry back, and the defensive end group is getting better and better each year, it's going to only make the linebacker group that much better. Because when they can be kept clean and they can run and hit, that's a linebacker's dream. And that's why it was so important for to bring in a guy like Dominic Williams. Because not only now do you have a Dejon Terry, but you have two Dejon Terrys, and you have potentially a better version of Dejon Terry. So when you go, you know, too deep with your nose tackle, you're not going to have a ton of drop off. It's going to be a lot better than what it was. And if you even want to go three deep at defensive tackle, at nose tackle, you're looking pretty good in that front too. And all of that's going to help the linebacker core, but it starts with Danny Stutzman. I mean, that guy is key to Oklahoma success. We saw it last year when he went down against Kansas and missed the Oklahoma state game. It, it threw Oklahoma's linebacker crew for, for a loop a little bit. They weren't as good. And the defense, you know, it didn't come through in key, key situations. Third down defense wasn't as good. But now you've got everybody with a little bit more experience, especially guys like Kobe McKenzie and Kip Lewis and Jaron Kanick. And you've got up-and-comers that are still kind of working their way into the rotation, working their way into playing time. It's a linebacker group that's going to be more dynamic it's going to have much more playmaking ability this year, and it's going to set help set the tone for Oklahoma's defense because Oklahoma wants to play in the backfield. They want to live in the backfield, and Oklahoma's linebacker group is going to be able to live in the backfield quite a bit this year. At the SEC meetings in Destin, Florida, uh, Greg Sankey talked about a lot of things. One thing he didn't really touch on a whole lot was uh, SEC expansion, and it's more about what he didn't say than what he said. And we're paying attention to here on Locked On Sooners. Coming up next, we're going to talk, could the SEC be circling for more uh, expansion in the future? We'll discuss next, coming up here on Locked On Sooners. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn, where over 2.5 million small businesses are using LinkedIn for hiring. So go post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And on your TV all day, have to turn down the volume with all that shouting, make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. 
part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So expansion, conference realignment, it is never ending. It's always and forever. And the SEC is going to be involved in the next round of realignment whenever that happens. The reason the ACC gets brought up so much is they are not happy with their media rights package, their media rights deal that goes to 2034. It's not a great package for the ACC. And so schools like Clemson, Florida State, North Carolina, they're all looking for a way out. They're all looking for a way to rescind the ACC's media rights deal to try and find a better package and get more money and more revenue coming to their schools. Well, schools like Florida State, North Carolina, Clemson, they're not thrilled. Some have even issued lawsuits against the ACC to see what the grant of rights says to get kind of more inside info. But the ACC is like, no, why would we, why would we share that info and make it public? It's, it's against, it goes against what would make us a profitable conference if we were to put that out there. But I mean, the, the ACC's media rights deal is not beneficial for the ACC schools. So they're going to be the target of, you know, expansion talk or conference realignment talk schools like Florida state, North Carolina, uh, you've even seen schools like Virginia involved in, in these discussions as well. Clemson is going to be a name that people keep an eye on. Miami, I think, is a name that everybody keeps an eye on as well. And so at SEC meetings in Destin, Florida, you know, Greg Sankey was asked about SEC expansion, and he said, we respect that there are agreements and situations that prevent a lot of movement. So our focus has been on our 16, but I pay attention. I think that's a notable, notable thing to, to pay attention to, you know, Greg Sankey is always going to be looking at what's going to make the conference more profitable. Why did they bring Texas A&M and, and Missouri in when they did? Cause it was going to make the conference more profitable, make them stronger. Why did they bring in Arkansas and South Carolina a long time ago? Well, it made the sec better. Why did they bring Oklahoma and Texas beyond any of those other schools, Oklahoma and Texas add to that blue blood strength that the sec is so proud of with Alabama and Georgia and LSU, Florida. And so they're always looking at opportunities to strengthen the conference and strengthen their, their stranglehold along with the big 10 on college football. And so it's only natural to assume that the SEC will be keeping an eye on everything that's going on in the ACC. Now, they're not going to be trying to buy out the ACC for programs because that buyout money is going to be too rich for the SEC, especially now that schools will be required to do some revenue sharing uh, with their student athletes. But it, it won't be surprising to see the SEC look at expansion somewhere down the road. The Big Ten is at 18 schools. The SEC is at 16. There's been speculation the SEC could try to get to 20 at some point. And so who would make sense for the SEC if they wanted to get to 20? Well, obviously, Florida State is going to be one of those programs that, hey, if you want to keep that really strong uh, feel in Florida, that strong you know presence in the state of Florida, well, you're going to go after one of the other two Florida big-time Florida schools. You've already got... Florida in the Gators in there. Why not get one of their rivals in Florida state, a team that they play every year. And it's a big time football game. And it's a one that moves the needle. It adds a rivalry to your conference slate. That's going to be very, very uh, interesting for the media companies when they're bidding on sec media rights, they're going to love having another rivalry game as a part of that media package, that broadcast package. Just like when they brought Oklahoma and Texas in, it was value added because you bring the Red River rivalry with it. Not only do you get Texas, Texas A&M, but you get arguably the greatest rivalry game in all of sports in the Red River showdown to come along with Oklahoma and Texas to the SEC. So it's huge value added. It makes a lot, a lot of sense. And so adding Florida State makes a lot of sense too because you get to have Florida, Florida State as part of the SEC's regular season and part of that media package every single year. So what are what's another school? I mean, you talk rivalries. Shoot, why not bring Oklahoma State? 
I know we're not going to sit here and say that they're on the same plane as Texas or they're at the same level as Florida, Florida State. But, dude, Oklahoma State is a rival. It may be one of those teams that you've beaten up on over the history of and the, the course of this matchup. But to me, that's not necessarily all that makes a rivalry. I mean, this is a school that's in state, a school that you're recruiting against, a school that, I mean, that game, it, it creates a lot of animosity. It creates a lot of energy. It creates a lot of excitement every single year. Everybody's hyped for Bedlam. And as much as Oklahoma fans aren't concerned about whether or not we get to play Bedlam anymore, I think college football purists see it like that's a game that should continue to happen every year. Maybe at some point down the road, it will happen every year. But one way to ensure that it happens every year is in that next round of SEC expansion. Bring Oklahoma State with you. There's enough natural rivalry there for it to move the needle on a national scale and move the needle with the broadcast groups that are going to be bidding on SEC media rights. It continues to give you that kind of Midwest Western footprint as well, expanding your audience, getting more eyeballs in football footprints and football landscapes to watch your product on a regular basis. But then you look at North Carolina, you look at Clemson, two big brands that have, you know, with North Carolina, you have relative football success with Clemson. You bring national titles, a program that despite some of the lackluster performances over the last couple of years, they were a national title winner twice beating the sec twice. So if they beat you, bring them on, let them join you. But you bring a big brand in Clemson, you bring a big brand in North Carolina, and you add that to what you have in the SEC. I mean, it gives you Clemson, South Carolina. It gives you South Carolina, North Carolina, nice little border war to have on your SEC slate every single year. North Carolina adds a lot from the baseball perspective or the basketball perspective. Clemson adds a lot in a lot of sports. They're a solid program in a lot of in a lot of ways. Softball, baseball basketball it may not be basketball like north carolina's basketball but it's a solid program that adds to the depth in your in your conference some other schools i mean i mentioned virginia was one that everybody was kind of looking at and that might be a natural fit too for baseball for basketball maybe football's not quite where it needs to be but that that's it's still going to move the needle and it's going to get you kind of closer to a dc footprint you know virginia it, it's it's kind of in that DMA or DMV area where you're going to have a chance to add another large media market to you. Just like adding North Carolina would add that Charlotte, that Raleigh Durham media mark, those media markets to your sec packages that will move the needle for, for investors and potential broadcast partners. So those are just a few programs. And, and I think like, okay, I know Oklahoma state may not serve the same purpose as some of the others that are being thrown out there to add to the sec, but it gives another rivalry game to the conference, Oklahoma state, good softball program, good baseball program, you know, had been a really good basketball program for the most part until it, prior to the last few years had been solid on the basketball floor. Uh, you know, if you ever want to get wrestling going on in the sec, well, Hey, you have Oklahoma already bringing it, bringing Oklahoma state. And that adds to it as well. So, you know, this is a, a solid program that would make a lot of sense for the SEC because Arkansas right there, Missouri right there, Oklahoma right there, natural rivals for the Oklahoma State Cowboys to be involved with on a regular basis. So we'll see. I mean, it, SEC expansion, you know, who knows when that next happens, but there's a chance it could happen anytime depending on what happens with the ACC media rights packages as well. I mean, Oklahoma State, they were kind of hurt that they got left behind by Oklahoma and were pretty upset about it. But would they jump at the chance to go to the SEC? I got to imagine they would because that SEC money is going to be something different than what the Big 12 can bring in. The Oklahoma Center softball program completed the four-peat, beating the Texas Longhorns in the Women's College World Series Finals. We're going to talk about that next, coming up here on Locked On Sooners. Summertime means baseball. Summertime means baseball. And the best place to get in on the action for this season is at FanDuel. 
the NBA Finals, and more. And you can bet on it all. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets you can use to bet on everything from the Finals MVP to who's going to hit one out of the park. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and add a big win to your summer bucket list. Right now, you go look at FanDuel, and some of the odds are really fascinating. Oklahoma sits at plus 500 to make the college football playoff. I mean, that's like 20th. I mean, it's pretty way down there. Uh, Jackson Arnold's odds to win the Heisman Trophy, plus 2,500. You know, it's kind of middle in the pack. It's it's a little bit further down than a Quinn Ewers at plus 900. But you can get in on all the action over at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Today, make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. The Oklahoma Sooner softball program won their fourth straight national title, eighth overall, uh, tying them with the Arizona Wildcats for second most national titles all time. Uh, and man, what a what a women's college World Series finals it was. The Oklahoma Sooners and the Texas Longhorns. Uh, Oklahoma outscored Texas sixteen to seven in the two games, and you know won in in pretty impressive fashion uh, to to capture that national title. You know, in the in the clincher. Uh, the Oklahoma Sooners and, and the Longhorns went back and forth. You know, Texas got the lead first, and then Oklahoma, they regained it. Uh, Texas took the lead back, and uh, it was just a, a fascinating ball game, you know, throughout. You know, Oklahoma went into this with Carly Keeney as the starter, and they threw five pitchers uh, before getting down to Nicole May and then Kelly Maxwell to close it off. Uh, but man, this game just had everything in it. You know, the, the Sooners got big time production from Cassidy Pickering, who had another home run, just continuing to add to her legend as a true freshman. Ella Parker had a, a RB or two RBI single. Sydney Sanders came through with, with, you know, the big hit um, to put Oklahoma ahead with a three RBI double. Um, and then, and then it was all she wrote. The Sooners kind of shut it down from there and captured history. It, it was an impressive, impressive performance for the Sooners. You know, you, you can't say enough about what this team was able to accomplish this year and and to do it in the way that they did when you could argue that maybe this wasn't their best team, that maybe this wasn't the the team that, you know, rattled off 61 wins last year and, and won seven games in a row heading into this year and, uh, you know, this was a team that just, you know, didn't look like they had the same kind of swagger energy, but man, they showed that they were a team that is still the best in the nation. Uh, Oklahoma was, uh, you know, down four to two, you know, going into the bottom of the fourth inning. And that's when Sidney Sanders, you know, a, a much maligned Sidney Sanders, a, a player who, you know, you look at what she did as a freshman at Arizona state, winning national player, national freshman of the year. 20 something home runs, 60 something RBIs hit over 400 and they came to Oklahoma and didn't really produce in the way that most people expected her to and just continue to battle. She just continued to, to get good at bats. She walked a ton this year and came through in a clutch situation for the Sooners. You know, they were down four to two uh, in the, in the fourth, she comes up after three straight base hits to load the bases and then hits that three RBI double to put Oklahoma ahead five to four. And I mean, it, it, it was one of those, one of those performances that, I mean, it's, it's a legendary performance and I mean, it, it could have been one of those. So I guess to put them up five to three um, and it, Oklahoma needed it. They needed every bit of that performance from Sidney Sanders who provided clutch defense uh, throughout her, you know, season with the Oklahoma Sooners, but then came through with a big hit, like she kind of had done the last week and a half or so of the season for the Sooners. Uh, I talked about Cassie Pickering, talked about Ella Parker, you know, Jada Coleman. I mean, the seniors on this team kept came through with clutch hits. You know, they didn't have the big RBI knocks, uh, but Jada Coleman in the sixth got the RBI single uh, to give Oklahoma some insurance, making it six to four, and then Ella Parker. You know, she came through. And she added the the two RBI single to make it eight to four. Oklahoma took advantage of you know a Mia Scott you know base running error uh, is kind of the best way to put that, and were able to get out of a a, 
a big time jam where it looked like Texas was threatening to tie the game. Nicole May, she pitched really, really well uh, in the fifth inning in the sixth inning ran into a little bit of trouble. And then Kelly Maxwell just came in and, you know, gave up one run, but then slammed the door in the seventh. I mean, she was absolutely dominant. You cannot say enough about what Kelly Maxwell did this postseason for the Oklahoma Sooners. She she was phenomenal. She just created for herself a legend, you know, similar to like Jordy Ball. You know, Jordy Ball wasn't here for very long, uh, but her performance for the Sooners made her a legend, made her somebody that Oklahoma fans really appreciated despite her short time with the Sooners. Same for Kelly Maxwell. Only spent one year for, with the Sooners. Uh, but was just absolutely phenomenal. You know, she, from the Duke series on, through close to 30 innings, the Duke game, you know, the, to open the Women's College World Series. Uh, you know, she had a bunch of strikeouts, 32 strikeouts in five games, um, you know, allowed a few runs. You know, that performance against Florida was kind of a gutsy performance. It wasn't her best, um, but she came back and, you know, she, she rallied, she held in there and she hung in there long enough to allow the Oklahoma Sooners to come back in that game and win it. Uh, things didn't start off great against Texas, but again, she hung in there, she battled and she gave Oklahoma a chance to get their bats going. And that's what ultimately won Oklahoma the game. You know, the fact that she was able to go back to back days and go 15 innings combined and throw over 200 and something pitches in those games, dude, it was clutch for the Sooners. Absolutely clutch. Uh, struck out eight Gators, struck out eight Longhorns, uh, and then came back with an inning and a third in the clincher. And again, just a dominant inning and a third for the Sooners. And dude, it, it's such a legacy moment for Kelly Maxwell, who, you know, things didn't end well for her during her time at Oklahoma State. You know, only she and, and uh, Kenny Gajewski know what all went down there. But, man, welcomed with open arms at Oklahoma, and she came through. And you, you can't say enough about what Kinsey Hansen and, and Jada Coleman and Tiara Jennings and Nicole May and Riley Boone were able to accomplish winning four national titles during their time at the with the Oklahoma Sooners, a feat that will, uh, will likely never be matched unless – over the next few years, Oklahoma continues to rattle off national title after national title after national title. And somebody like Ella Parker, Cassidy Pickering continues the run, which, Hey, I'm not going to sit here and doubt them because those two look like superstars in the making. And if Oklahoma can continue to build around them with, I mean, they've got a strong freshman class coming in next year. I know Patty Gasso and Jen Rocha and JT Gasso are going to be active in the transfer portal. And they're going to add talent to a, a roster that's still pretty talented despite losing 10 seniors. It, it, man, I'm, I cannot wait to see how they build this roster. But what a season it was. It just it boggles the mind what they're able to accomplish despite, you know, losing Jordy ball, uh, despite losing grace lions, this team just continued to mature and continued to just battle every single week. You know, they lost two series, one to Texas, one to Oklahoma state, but it didn't matter. They rallied when the postseason came, they turned it on, won the big 12 tournament, and then rattled off a bunch of wins in regionals and, and super regionals. And then just lost one game in the women's college world series and then battled in an elimination game to keep their se season alive and then just absolutely dominated Texas to win their fourth national title. But that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of the show. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. I'm John Williams. Follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. The show is at Locked On Sooners. Again, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all podcast platforms. But until next time, Boomer Sooner.